Welcome to the first lecture of Machine Learning One. Uh, my name is Eric Beckes. I'll be your teacher for this course and I'll be recording a lot of videos like these. And this is basically the first one. Um, so, well, let's get started with it. I thought it made sense to start off with explaining what we actually mean with the term machine learning. I mean, nowadays it seems that almost any algorithm that uses data of some sort is called a machine learning algorithm. Uh, for example, this often includes concepts we are used to to refer to simply as statistics. Um, so, well, let's, let's just start off by making precise what we mean with machine learning and we'll see that it is indeed a quite general term which we can break down into several subcategories. Now, this is a widely used definition of machine learning put forward by Tom Mitchell, who is a renowned researcher in the field. He wrote a book about it. Um, basically, this is what he had to say about it. Uh, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay, so this is a beautiful sentence, but it's very hard to parse. So let's just break it down into these three core components. First of all, a computer program is designed to perform some task T. Right, so we want to automate some pro pro process, and we call it this. Oh, sorry, we call this the task T. Right. Now, in this context of machine learning, such a task always comes equipped, or such an algorithm always comes equipped with a performance measure P, and this performance measure P is a way of quantifying how well uh, the algorithm is doing its job. Okay, and basically want to optimize this performance measure. Then, how are we going to do this? We're going to do this with experience E. So this is, let's say, the most important notion of machine learning is the, the, the concept of experience E, which is used to improve my algorithm. And this improvement is measured by this performance measure P. Now this first example, it's uh, in the context of image analysis or uh, really converting handwritten digits, images of handwritten digits to the actual digits. Right, so the task is uh, looking at these images, they're already sorted here, but so if you look at the top row, these are all zeros, and we want to recognize that as being a zero. These are, these are ones, these are twos, uh, and so on. Right, so now experience comes in the form of labeled images. Uh, the experience is that someone uh, showed me an image like this one and said, this is a zero. Um, someone else wrote down this thing and said, this is a tree. Okay, so based on this experience, I'm going to improve an algorithm uh, that, that automates this task of digit classification. So this is a famous data set called the MNIST data set. You will encounter it throughout this course. So it consists of handwritten digits of size 28 by 28. Okay? Um, yeah, okay, so let, let's move to the, to the next uh, uh, topic. Now, now we're considering a different task, a different setting, and we're, we're considering actually the, the analysis of tumors. Um, why is this relevant? Um, well, uh, there are many types of tumors. Some are benign, some are malignant, so they are very harmful, and we want to treat them as soon as possible. And sometimes it's not really easy to see from the outside or from some some medical image scan, whether, what, what type of tumor it is. And we can actually, that is actually a way to determine, determine the type of tumor uh, more accurately. And that's by uh, looking at the expression of, of certain genes. So what we're looking at here is an expression matrix of genes. Um, or on the horizontal axis, we have the tumor types. Uh, so each column represents one tumor. So uh, for example, this one represents a, a breast tumor uh, this one represents uh, leukemia. Now on the uh, vertical axis, so each row represents a particular gene. And what this plot uh, really shows, it, it's a heat map. Or we can look, consider it as a heat map for activity of a gene. So when the color is green, uh, we basically say this gene is very active. Uh, if it's red, it's not particularly active. And um, what is actually measured is uh, messenger RNA. So this is a product, uh, a protein in all biological signal processing pipeline. 
and the genes basically describe a way of how to produce these uh, mRNAs. Um, but the point is, we are able to measure the activity of genes. And so now we can invent several tasks related to this data. And one of the maybe most obvious tasks is to automatically classify such a profile as belonging to one of the tumor classes. And what we see here, all this data, we can think of it as experience, right? So uh, let's take, for, for example, look at this particular profile. Uh, whenever we see a profile like this, uh, we might be tempted to say, oh, this is uh, a melanoma we're looking at. Why? Because, for example, you see a lot of green, so a lot of activity of this particular gene. So it encodes for small nuclei, I guess. Um, but experience tells us that whenever we see a pattern like this, uh, it's probably a melanoma. Right? So this kind of experience we're going to use uh, in maybe some other examples later on to automate uh, the process of labeling uh, samples into several tumor classes, as in this case. Now, this is a type of experience that maybe you can all relate to. It has to deal with uh, the classification of, uh, well, identification of spam in your mailbox. Um, so basically, again, experience in the form of data. And in this case, the data are, uh, well, sentences, it's text. So basically our experiences, for example, that we, um, well, whenever we see these sort of discount trigger phases, we're tempted to say, oh, this is spam, I don't care about it, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read it. And there's all these cues that from experience we learned that, okay, uh, these are indicators of spam. So that's how we can look at the experience. And we can use this experience uh, to design or to improve automated algorithms. Okay, so that was focusing mostly on the experience part. Uh, now let's have a closer look at the, the task. Uh, so, right, a, a machine learning algorithm has to perform a particular task. And typically it, it relates to automating some process that we as humans are used to doing um, to, to a computerized format. For example, the task would be classification. And classification means we have an input and we want to place it in some, some class. So if let, let's do it manually. I see a two over here. I see an 8 over here, it says a 0, this is an 8 or a 9, I don't know, um, this could be an 8, could also be a 9, I'm not fully sure. But the point is we want to assign each image to one of the, the, the particular classes. And later on actually we'll, we will adopt a more probabilistic viewpoint, um, meaning that sometimes we're not fully sure, like uh, in these cases, if we're looking at an 8 or a 9. And then we want to assign probabilities, like uh, with some probability this is an 8 and with some other probability this is a 9. And then maybe later on we can still make decisions based on these probabilities, but we have a notion of uncertainty. Okay, that, that's a task. Uh, so also for the spam identification, this is also a classification task. We want to classify the, the, the sentences as either spam or non-spam. So let's do it manually again. Spam. Is spam? Yeah, spam. Sure. Yeah, that's, suggest, that's, and then we want to... that's spam for sure. Okay, so um, machine learning is all uh, about automating these kind of processes. Um, well, not, not, not necessarily only about automatic processes, also to, for exploring data, but we'll see that later on. Okay, so we just covered one class of tests, namely classification, where the task was given this input, put it into one out of, let's say, n discrete classes. Uh, a different class of tests is that of regression. In this particular case, uh, we're looking at inputs, for example, this input x, and we want to map it to some corresponding value here on this vertical axis. So we want to find a function that maps this in input x to some, some value. And this value is no longer discrete. It can be any, it, it is a continuous thing. So anywhere on this vertical axis we can, can place this target value. Um, so that's the main thing about regression task if that, that is that we're not mapping to just a discrete value, but to a continuous scale of values. And um, so when we talk about regression, we typically think of uh, function fitting. And in, in this case, um, so we'll use this ex example a lot during this talk. 
So we see this green line, let's think of it as a true signal. So uh, this green line is actually a sign to pi of x. So that's our ground truth sort of. Uh, but in reality we always have to measure things or uh, we have to deal with measurement errors, uh, measurement noise. So the things that we actually measure, like so these blue points, is actually this true signal with some epsilon noise, some random variable. And typically we, we model this with uh, a normal distribution, for example, with zero mean and unit variance. Um, yeah, so okay, the task is given an input x, map it to some continuous uh, output through some function f of x, and the goal is to find this function f of x. Now, again, if I would want to do this manually, then what I would probably do is define some class of functions, let's say polynomials. Polynomials, you have to form like f of x is some constant, w0, plus a weight 1 times x, plus a weight 2 times x squared, and so on, uh, up to some weight m times x to the power m. Uh, so I have some, some choices to make here. One, first of all, the order of, of the, the polynomial, and then I have to find um, well the optimal weights that make sure that this function comes close to my target value. Right, so I've measured these blue points. I've measured these blue points, and now I want to find a function that best fits through these uh, blue points. And green is the ground true reference that we actually want to recover, but we don't know it. Now, if I just pick a zero to order polynomial, then I'm really dealing with a straight line. So I can only tune this offset parameter and then this horizontal line is the best I can do. If I uh, go to a higher order, well, MS1, it's, I'm just adding this slope to it. So I'm looking at these two coefficients. So, so I'm tweaking these W values and I found that this is really the best I can do. Uh, so this is of course a very tedious task to do manually and we we'll want to automate this. Now uh, when you go to higher order, maybe at some point M is 3, I actually am able to do a pretty decent job. Uh, so this red curve seems to flow nicely through the data. So I'm quite satisfied with this. But of course we can move it a bit to the extreme. So let's go to an order M is 9 and then I get this extreme fit. Uh, but what you can see, it exactly moves to the data points. So these blue measured points, my red curve fits perfectly. So I was able to tune my W's such that I have a perfect fit basically on this data. Though it looks a bit wiggly and I'm not super satisfied with this, but given my data, I would say this is a, a pretty good fit. Okay, so we had the class of uh, classification. We have a class of task called regression. And then we also have clustering. Now clustering is also uh, a task of itself. And the idea is mostly to explore the data, to find structure in the data. Um, if we think about tumor classification, um, maybe we know that there, are, that there are different types of tumors. I'm not fully sure how many types, but one, some part of this subset of tumors are very harmful and some are not. And we want to sort of look which tumors are more closely related than others. And uh, you can do this by clustering methods. So uh, let's take a look at this data. So horizontal on this plot were all different tumor types. And if you now just select one of them, basically this activation pattern, we can represent it as an uh, n-dimensional vector. For the purpose of illustrating this, uh, we just assume that we have a way of reducing this n-dimensional vector to uh, a 2D point. Basically this 2D vector, a uh, vector of length 2, that's sort of a summarizing uh, vector of this n-dimensional vector. Uh, we, later we will see ways of actually learning how to do this mapping, but now we just assume that we have a way of representing each tumor with just uh, two values. Okay, so then we can fill in this plot on the right. So we have a lot of tumors measured. We all compute this 2D uh, summarizing coefficients and we plot them. So one point is one tumor. Now the, now the task is to explore if there are uh, patterns or if there are tumors that are related to each other. 
and we can do this via clustering. And let's just quick, quickly go over a, a way of doing this. Like we could do this by assigning each tumor. Let's say there are four classes. So we want to divide uh, all these tumors into four categories. So what we could initially do, we just randomly assign. So let's write it down. So randomly assign each xi to one of four classes. And that's what you do, what, you, what, you, what we show here. So each color represents one class, and then we have this nice colorful point cloud. Uh, what we can do next is just look at the mean uh, to the value, to the vector value of each class, uh, because that's sort of summarizing well, what a tumor within this class looks like. So if we compute the mean over all the, the yellow points, it's probably located somewhere over here. It's close to the origin because it's so spread out. Um, if we look at the mean of the blue points, it's over here. Red, uh, green over here, red over here. So these crosses, which maybe you don't see too well, this, this is what I call the cluster means, mu i. Okay, what I can then do next, so basically these mu i's are a descriptor of my class of tumors. It's, uh, well, the, the average uh, vector value in, within that class. So what I can do is just look at, now again I reiterate, so I look at all my points and I want to assign them to, well, the closest mu i. So the, the closer to which it looks most similar to. And what you then get is this partition over here. Because the centers were here here, here, and here. Um, okay, so now we have a new partition and we can, uh, of course, uh, reiterate. Uh, so look for closest cluster or actually maybe most similar cluster. Um, yeah, and then we so we compute the mean of each cluster. So we have a new mean over here, here and here. We iterate, and then we get this partition. And uh, so basically, what this tells us, uh, we find a way of partitioning all my data into four classes. And uh, basically, we, we are now able to say if a, if a new point comes in, for example, this one, it's closest to the yellow class. So uh, we know which kind of tumors are similar. Okay, and we can use this later on in our analysis if we have to make decisions about treatment, for example, then we, then we can look for a treatments that were successful on patterns that were in the same cluster, then maybe it makes sense to use the same treatment for, um, well, this type of tumor that we just measured. Okay, uh, then we come to performance measures. So, of course, we have a task, uh, we have experience to improve this task, but we have we need a way of measuring if my if we are actually improving on performing this uh, this test. That's that's done via performance measures. For classification, uh, a relatively straightforward thing that you could think of is simply count the amount of times that you were actually correct in um, making your prediction. Um, yeah, so let's write it down. Uh, we can write it down mathematically as follows. So uh, we just take the average over this indicator function, which looks at in which cases my uh, label, or actually my prediction, which is this why I had, coincides with my label. And this indicator function, we will encounter it more often in the course. It's defined, so let's write it down. This is called an indicator function. And it's defined as being one if y i is y i hat and it's zero ah, sorry basically it is zero otherwise okay so you can directly see that if all my predictions are correct then this sum or this average averages to one if everything is wrong then the, the accuracy is zero and if i'm right 50 percent of the time the accuracy value is 0.5 Okay, so we have a way of quantifying how well I'm doing my job at classification. Also for regression, we can think of uh, ways of measuring its performance. 
what is typically used is the mean squared error. Uh, error. You may have encountered that in your studies already. So mean squared error. So again, let's write this down. Uh, we have labeled data. So for every x i, I have a target y i. And I have a prediction that I made. I made this prediction y i hat. I look at the difference, I square it, and I take the, the average over all my uh, samples. So that's the mean squared error. And again, this, this yi, it's sort of this function that we are fitting, which was parameters by, parameterized by a set of weights w takes as input this xi. So we had labeled uh, data, right? For XI, every xi, we had a yi. Okay, so of course, this is what we want to optimize. And this is what we were doing actually in this example before when I was doing this manually. So if we look at the differences of uh, the red line, which is our fit, and the data points, or the blue points, you will see a lot of differences. So we would say this has a large mean squared error. Um, let's go to the third example. These differences are actually not too, too bad. So I would say uh, this is a small mean squared error. And in this particular case, uh, really the, the curve or fit goes straight through these data points. So we would say that this, this right model is actually doing a perfect job because it has a mean squared error of, of zero. Now also when we talk about clustering, we have to come up with a performance measure, a way of saying how, how well we are doing our job. And so we have to think about what our objective is. And with this clustering, really what we're looking for is to find clusters of points that are very similar to each other. And we can quantify this similarity within a cluster by looking at uh, uh, the distance of each point to a cluster center, right? So each cluster had uh, some, some average uh, value and we want to minimize the distance within each other, uh, within the cluster to each of these, these centers. So that's to have a sort of compact group of points. So we can quantify that by looking indeed at the distance of each cluster center towards each point in its cluster. And basically this min operator here is sort of selecting uh, the appropriate cluster, right? So if we take a point of this point, look at the distance to each center, then the blue center is the closest one. And that's the distance what I, that I want to consider. All right, so in the example before, we were actually sort of optimizing this performance measure. Now, a main thing is, is so a main thing in this whole machine learning process is reporting these performance measures. Uh, but the tricky part is um, it could give you a biased view of how well the algorithm is doing. Uh, so if you look at the performance measures on these four models that, that I went through, like a, the first one did a very bad job. The third one was actually doing a great job. And the fourth one, yeah, I mean, given this performance measure, uh, measure, it was doing an excellent job. But if I look at it, I would say it's actually not so good. Uh, so let's see what's happening here. So if we take a look at the best performance on the training set. So the training sets were these blue dots then it's for sure this, this rightmost model it was doing a perfect job on the training set. But if we look at it like, okay, which model is performing best on new data, then it's probably this one, right? So if I take some new point, uh, some X value, and it's probably mapped close to this green, the, the true data with some noise. So let's, so maybe it's somewhere over here, then yeah, I. I have this small distance, so it's actually quite okay. But if I look at the same point in, in this, this right model, then yeah, the, the corresponding point on my model is maybe somewhere over here. So it's, a, it's doing a terrible job and I make a large error. So if I would um, report the performance measure on this new set of points, which I haven't seen before, then the rightmost model does a very poor job, whereas the, the third model actually does a good job. So that brings us to the question on, on which data points should performance be measured? Um, well, it should always be done on a test set, at least if you want to have an impression of how, how well it is at generalizing to new data points, you should always test it on an independent test set. So let me write it down. 
performance should be measured on new data so which we typically call test data right so really really uh, remember that whenever you report numbers uh, you should do this on a test set which you haven't seen before otherwise you will get a biased impression and you would have the impression that you're doing actually a great job but then when you really move your uh, machine learning algorithm to the field to, to some application it turns out uh, you're actually doing a very terrible job because you uh, actually overfit it to the data that's what this phenomenon uh, on the right is called it's called overfitting all right so what we did in this, uh, this short lecture is we went through a definition of machine learning. We broke it down into three components. So our main component is a task. So this is really what we designed the algorithm to do. And then based on experience, we, we were improving uh, well, the performance of, of doing this, this task and how well it was performing that was quantified by some performance measure, P.